Greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Taylor Hobynum. I'm the director of the Coast Jazz Orchestra at Dartmouth, and I'm also the professor of uh, jazz, black music, black creative music, and American culture. Of course, I've been teaching uh, in the winter term here in the music department. And in a collaboration of those two uh, hats, I'm very excited to introduce our first um, episode of what we are going to call Coastin, uh, Creative Music Conversations, uh, a chance to talk with some of the leading figures in contemporary music. Um, and yes, and we're going to take it from there. Uh, let me introduce my co-host, uh, Noah Campbell. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Noah Campbell. I'm a 21. I'm a government major and a Black Studies minor. Um, and as Taylor mentioned, I'm also a member of the Coast and a TA for the uh, Jazz History course that he's teaching. And I'm really excited for this uh, conversation with Warren Smith. Exactly. I could not imagine a better guest uh, for our inaugural episode of Coastin than the amazing Warren Smith. Um, it is not hyperbole to say that uh, his has been one of the most extraordinary careers in American music, um, both in the breadth of what he has done and the quality of what he has done. Um, I've been lucky enough to uh, know him as a mentor and friend and occasional collaborator for over 20 years now um, and, and a fan of his, <laughs> he's, he's one of my heroes um, inside and outside of this music. And so it is with great pleasure um, that uh, I welcome Warren Smith. Great to see you. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. I think your work is remarkable, not just for the genre of music that you've been involved with, um, but also your identity as a multiple percussionist, somebody who has been, you know, I've seen recordings of you on everything from drum kit to timpani to vibraphone and marimba to triangle and cowbell. And then all of these instances making it, you know, extraordinarily musical, uh, contributions to the context that you've been in. Um, two questions on this. Uh, do you feel like being a percussionist and being a percussionist across so many different instruments informed how you approached being involved in so many different genres? And also of that sort of diversity of interest, is there one particular member of the percussion family that is sort of your favorite child, is sort of your most home base? Well, I have to say my favorite is the kettle drums, the timpani, you know, and no one was ever improvising on that instrument and it was completely discouraged. That's why I had to do everything in a class of Dean fashion, clandestine fashion. Uh, I, you know, get myself locked into school so that I could play after all the instructors and, and the spies of them left that might report me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I mean, now all of a sudden I look back and they are awarding doctorates of music in African-American music, you know, and in my particular, I, I was the 31st person in the United States to get a master's degree in percussion. And I thought that was pretty weird at that time. I hadn't thought about not being able to do that, but you had to kind of teach these kinds of things in a very clandestine matter, you know. Uh, um, I started teaching in the, the junior high schools and they give you a book of songs that you're supposed to teach these students, all right? And they were written by, uh, you know, people from the South and old Black Joe and the darkies and the this and the that, you know. So when I went to school, I looked at this group of Black children I'm teaching, junior high school, they don't want to hear that shit, <laughs> you know, they really did not. So the first thing I did was pull out a Benny King song that I had taught myself on the piano and started playing the bass line. And then I looked at the kids and they all came in and sang the whole damn song. And by the time we finished that song, the principals and the assistant principals were in the back of the room to see what I had done to quiet these students down, you know. Now, now, there was never anything about what do these kids like or what are they interested in or what kind of music do their parents listen to. It was always you had to be like subservient to what the Board of Education was doing. And there was nobody on the Board of Education that knew, you know. So these were things. In fact, when I started teaching, there wasn't a teacher's union. 
we we were part of the people that even were involved in organizing the actual United Federation of Teachers. And that really helped things because it freed everything else and it started us talking about these things across cultures. You know, I mean, there's a completely different culture that we have that a lot of white people knew nothing about. You know what I mean? And on the other hand, we were forced into knowing everything from the Star Spangled Banner and da 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 and, you know, all this stuff. And um, all of a sudden, I wind up being a teacher for 40 years of this music that I was trying to get across. And it just kind of, it, it's its my destiny to do that, I guess. But I'm glad that I was one of the few that, that started it. And now, like I say, I, I have no intention of being a doctor, but you can get a doctorate in quote unquote jazz music, you know? And, and, and let me say that that term, I was taught to be offended by that by none other than Max Roach, because that is music that is associated with houses of ill repute, shall we say, you know what I'm talking about. So the very term jazz itself was indicative of fornication, you see. So it enabled people who did not respect artists like Charlie Parker and, and all these Art Tatum, you know, nobody could play more piano than Art Tatum can play. I don't care what kind of music you were playing. And it taught them that they had to respect this music as well, because we found out later that the music was being exported out of the United States overseas to Europe and everywhere else was our music. They didn't want to hear the music that they had created referred to them through American. They wanted to hear the music that was created here in America. So this is a whole level of appreciation and respect that we never had that other people in other countries bestowed upon us outside of this country. And you know what? This is something that we're still working on. I mean, you know, in, in other ways, but, but this is what it is. You know, this, we are still working on this leveraging of respect for everybody else's culture. Now, we came up in a family where all of our people were educated musicians on both sides. My, all of my uncles and aunts and my mother and my father were professional musicians. My father and a lot of my other uncles wound up working at the post office, which I did too. I've been about five years at the post office. But I knew that I didn't want to make this my subsidiary income to my musical career. And so I got into music education, you know, and that meant learning a whole lot of stuff that I knew was going to have to be thrown in the trash bag 
as soon as I had the authority to do so, because it was offensive to me, both racially and culturally, to see, you know, I mean, literally, you're supposed to be, here I am, the one black person in the class, and I'm supposed to be talking about old black Joe and the darkies down home and all that kind of, no, no, no. So I, I, I guess it was somewhere deep inside of me to, to make this fight, but I wasn't the only one that was thinking about this. You know, there were many of us that were thinking about this. You know, Max Roach was five years older than I was, 10 years older than I was, and had gone through this. So when I started discussing things like this, it spurred something in him that made him get back into, into education so that we could together work with things like this, you know, and you know, places like Amherst College um, was one of the first places, and that was because Max was a guest professor up there at that time and was able to attract a whole bunch of um, African-American musicians into a whole conference, which continued for years and years. And in fact, it, you know, this was before um, uh, the Newport Jazz Festival and all these things were prominent. You know, so all of these things, Max Roach, I, I went to the classical music program at Tanglewood in 1956. You know, Tanglewood is the music camp of the Boston Symphony Orchestra in the summer. And and I was there as a timpani student. There was a nightclub across the road from there that had jazz entertainment. Randy Wesson was playing piano in this club. And Max came up one of the first jazz programs on the Newport Jazz Festival, you know, one of one of the first, you know, and started hanging out with Randy at a night that I was there. And he saw me and was interested in the fact that here was a black classical percussionist that he didn't know about. So he and I formed a relationship out of that. And he said, well, as soon as you come to New York, when you come, get in touch with me right away. And um, it got to the point where um, I formed a studio to rehearse because, you know, I mean, you can't rehearse the drums in peace at home. You know, I'm, I'm sure, young man, that you know that by now. You, <laughs> you, have, to, you have to find someplace else. So I had a studio and the studio began being used by other professional musicians, Max Roach and his quartet being one of them. And he noticed the timpani and other different percussion instruments that I had. And he came up with the idea of starting a percussion ensemble that was not playing classical music or classically oriented music, but music that was from the tradition of, of our own people, you know, African-American music. In fact, he stopped using the word jazz entirely because of its reflection, you know, uh, as an association with a house of your repute. And um, what happened was we would be rehearsing and we'd be attracting people coming, sitting on the fire escape and on the roof and listening to what the heck was going on because they hadn't heard anything like this. And the first performance that we did, actually, I, I was a um, associate professor. You know, they had finally decided to put um, African-American studies into some of the colleges. And... Um, there was a college in Garden City, Long Island, um, that had hired me to do a jazz program. And um, you look up and all of a sudden, all this interest is feeding into it. So they had to keep enlarging it. They, they, um, those programs became the center of African American studies programs. You know, there was no such thing even in the colleges then. And so here we are sitting here trying to educate people of music that was always sacred to us.
I'm sitting in a big band like Johnny Richards band and I'm sitting here and this great drummer is sitting here and the only thing between us is a thin curtain. So while all these people were playing, I was watching what Charlie Persip's fingers were doing when he controlled the drumstick, you know, and I could see that he kicked his fingers out like this. And then Philly Joe Jones had a way where his wrist would swing back and forth like a pendulum. You know, and all of these things, I, I kept watching these little details because I had this proximity, you know. Um, so and at the same time, I had to learn all the um, classical techniques of playing a very refined snare drum roll from in the semi up to triple forte and back down again, doing all these kinds of things. You know, you'd be surprised you go into a place to um, audition even for a Broadway show. I'll, I'll tell you another experience that I had. And it was obvious to me that they don't want to give me this job. They don't want to give this job to a black man, you know? So you go in there and they ask you to do some kind of crazy stuff. Like um, this particular piece had one of the most uh, difficult snare drum sequences in it uh, that was incorporated into the show as a dance piece. So I come in cold and they give me this part and they set it up on the stand and say, here, play this, you know. Well, I had already memorized it because I had learned it in college. So I'm sitting there and I, I'm playing this thing and they wait for the solo to come and then I come and I didn't stumble and I played through it. And in fact, I had it so memorized that I'm watching them watching me, you know, and they're all sitting there. <laughs> Does he do it, you know? And I just played it, you know, and just, you know, and went on about my business. <laughs> well, they had to give me the job, you know? <laughs> but I mean, these are the kind of things that you keep bumbling up into, you know? And, um, but I found that all this combination of things, you know, see, they didn't have the access to watching great drummers like Charlie Persip and Philly Joe Jones and Max Roach and how they gripped the, you know, plus a lot of them weren't even interested. You know, so I was able to see those things and eventually refine some of my uh, talents and techniques. Oh, I've, I've got a story that you would be interested in. I went to, um, I was playing with a show in Boston. So I heard that there was a, you know, one of my favorite drummers, Alan Dawson, was playing at this club. So I said, okay, after the show, I went down to the club seeing, oh, Alan Dawson's not in today. I said, oh, shucks, I missed it. I said, well, who, they said, well, we got this little 13-year-old kid. I said, damn, I didn't come to hear no student play. And 13-year-old kid happened to be named Anthony Williams. And he sat down and played for one set, and it scared me so bad, man, that I had to go back and practice for three years before <laughs> I felt that I could be a professional drummer. This Tony Williams... I mean, it was, you know, and and a few years later, I went back to Boston and encountered a little girl playing drums whose father I knew was a saxophone player. Um, and she happened to be Terry Lynn Carrington. <laughs> and she's <laughs> a lot of me too, you know. But, I mean, it was so interesting to see how much farther I had with a master's degree to learn and go in order to consider myself proficient in that instrument. And... I still allow myself to get scared. I still allow myself to encounter people who are doing something that maybe I can't do, you know, that I can tone up a little bit on it, that I can, you know. So it's a never ending process, you know. Mm -hmm. But you'd be very happy when you encounter those kinds of things, you know, and, and keep them stored up here. They'll come in handy.
And all these things you really have to practice. I actually had to do weightlifting. You know, I'm, I mean, my feet, my legs weren't reacting like I wanted them to. And I watched somebody like Tony Williams. I, I had the, the um, privilege of being able to watch him because he formed a band and he decided he wanted three percussionists in it. He wanted somebody who could play the marimba and the timpani. And he wanted somebody who could play all of the hand drums. And that was Don Elias. And I was a timpanist that got recommended to him. But when he played, he had developed his legs so that his legs and his feet had the same dexterity on the drum set that his hands did. So he could play a single stroke roll with his arms and he could sit down on the two pedals of the drum and play the single stroke roll the same way. You know, and he had a way that he could flutter his feet, his, his feet so that he could get instead of boom, 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 he you know, and I'm watching him do all this stuff night after night. And I said, that's impossible. You can't, you know, but it's not impossible because he's doing it. And he's a little bitty guy. You know, he wasn't like ah, muscular, and, you know, <laughs> but it was like he would hear a sound and he'd say, I'm going to produce that sound and you leg are going to do it. And, that's, ah, and, hit, and, and these things would just, you know, it was a whole different attitude that I had to absorb to conceive of what he's doing and then apply it to myself. And not to say that I'll ever be the kind of great drummer that Tony Williams and all, all these people, no. You know, that's, they, but I was able to use some of the tools that they use to enhance my presentation. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm learning something from all of these people all the time. You know, I'm studying them. I, I, there was a way that, that, that Philly Joe Jones flicked out his finger when he, when he hit the cymbal, you know. And, and what I realized was that he was allowing himself to condition how far the stick came off of the cymbal when it bounced. And his finger would control it so that it, would, so that it wouldn't go wrong, you know, like that. He could control it. And he could double it or triple it. And I watched all these things realize that every little muscle in your body has some usage that you can transform into your instruments. And you know, I've seen people do some things on the saxophone that they don't teach you to do with the regular mouthpiece and approach. You know what I mean? You, you look at somebody like Yusuf Latif and he's playing thunder on a saxophone. And you say, how do you, you know? But it's there, you know, these things are in the instruments to explore and to try. So I'm trying to be my own scientist and, and spread that information to other people who want to do that so that you can explore and you'll find some things that you can think of that nobody else thought of and employ that in your presentation. Smith, legendary percussionist, composer, arranger, uh, inspiration to so many of us. Thank you so much for being our first guest on this new series. I couldn't imagine a better person. You're quite welcome. And young man, don't forget to be yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely will not. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs>